I think let's get started now, um, everybody, um, so that we can make sure to finish on time for, for, for lunch, which is of always of the utmost importance, except, of course, for, for listening to these, these wonderful presentations. Welcome to the panel um, on studies on memory um, in international relations, cases and approaches. We have five speakers, so um, particularly since I have Felix here on my right, I'm going to be reasonably strict about the time. Um, three of our speakers are here in person, as we see, and then two, two will be joining us um, online. Um, so let's, with, with no further ado, let's get started. I'm very pleased to introduce our first speaker, who will be talking on the impact of memory about the end of the Cold War on international politics after 30 years. His name is Marek um, Cichotsky. Hopefully, I pronounced that okay. Um, it's kind of terrifying to try and pronounce Polish in, in Poland. Um, he's a professor for international relations at Collegium Civitas and associated professor at the European, um, as the European Civilization Chair of College um, of, of Europe in Natalin. Um, Marek Cichotsky has been the research director of the Natalin European Centre in War here in Warsaw and editor in chief for the new um, Natalin Review magazine since 2004. From 2007 to 2010, he served as advisor to President of the Republic of Poland, um, Professor Lech Kaczynski, and acted as a, it says Sherpa, I'm quite interested. Um, oh, okay, for the Lisbon Treaty negotiations, that makes sense. Um, he's a permanent professor at the Institute of Applied Social Sciences of the University of Warsaw, here again. And since 2003, he's also been a publisher and editor-in-chief of the yearly um, Dialogia Politichna. Um, Marek Cichotsky has authored uh, numerous, numerous books, essays and articles on international relations from power and remembrance in 2006 to problems of political union in Europe 2012 and many, many more besides. Marek. Thank you, Thank you very much for this introduction. And um, yes, indeed, I, I, I shall... Uh, speak about um, memorization of the end of the Cold War and the impact of um, the ways how the end uh, was memorized on on um, on what is uh, um, taken as the major lessons uh, for the legacy of the of the end of the Cold War. And of course, uh, re recalling um, uh, the end of the Cold War immediately evokes um, two iconic um, events. And the first one is, um, of course, the fall um, of uh, Berlin Wall uh, in November 1989. The second um, uh, is the um, collapse of Soviet Union. And of course, the first event is the more iconic uh, because of um, uh, dynamic, uh, expressive uh, pictures we have of, uh, of, this, of this event. Um, and uh, just uh, to give you one example from yesterday, we, we, uh, we, we just launched um, a project about the legacy of the end of the Cold War at our is European Civilization Char for our students. And I ask his, uh, the assistant, a young person, to, to prepare materials for the students about the project. And he did it very well. Uh, uh, and um, he added uh, something on the front page of these materials, uh, uh, the picture, to visualize uh, uh, the topic. And uh, I suppose you uh, will have no problems to guess which one. Uh, of course, the picture uh, showing uh, uh, Brandenburg Gage uh, and, and, and Ronald Reagan in front of it, or rather behind <laughs> the gate, uh, 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 actually uh, um, uh, having this famous speech uh, you remember uh, Mr. Gorbachev turned down this, um, uh, this, the, 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 this wall. So after, after 30 years um, 
for many people, especially young people, this is iconic uh, uh, picture uh, to, to demonstrate uh, 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 the meaning of uh, uh, what was the end of the, uh, of the Cold War. In, in my paper, uh, paper, I tried to uh, identify, however, some um, major convictions or ideas which contributed, in my view, uh, mostly to create um, certain um, narratives about the end of the Cold War, which dictated the way in which the lesson from these events was, was drawn with the impact of, on, on the post-Cold War international uh, politics. And, and um, I identified the four uh, major convictions, ideas. Of course, the list can be extended, certainly. This is just only my uh, proposition. The first conviction, the, the end of the Cold War and the reunification of Germany were two nearly acquired processes and events. Hence, the German reunification symbolized by the fall of the Berlin Wall should be placed at the very center of what was remembered in Europe as the end of the Cold War. And uh, as uh, the example I showed to, to, to you at the beginning is, um, is uh, uh, certainly the illustration of um, endurance of this kind of uh, uh, conviction. The second, the reunification of Germany as the core event of the end of the Cold War became equal with the reunification of European continent and even further of the global unification of the post-Cold War world. By that, the United Germany became the genuine cornerstone of the European unity and the master example of the new post-Cold War politics, labeled also as the postmodern, post-national or post-historical politics. The third conviction, the basic character of the end of the Cold War was mainly the peaceful transformation, allowing to avoid the use of violence and consequently to replace the traditional politics of the 19th and 20th century by the new postmodern ones. The way of dismantlement of the Soviet Union and the transformation of the Central and Eastern Europe should serve as convincing examples. And finally, the fourth a conviction I identified the major specificity and achievement of the end of the Cold War should be perceived in the lack of the zero-sum game logic and in agreeing that the Cold War was won by all parties, <clears throat> as it was emphasized by Nik uh, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev already in 1992. So there were no losers and all were winners. So these are uh, my um, four proposed convictions which laid foundations for uh, what, what was uh, taken as the, as the major legacy of the end of the Cold War. And now I think, especially after 30 years and in light of, um, of the current events we are witnessing in uh, the war in Ukraine, Russian invasion, and so forth and uh, so forth. I think that um, we, we should look at these convictions um, not in a different way, but uh, certainly um, a little bit more critical. Uh, because uh, uh, this uh, um, need to, to look at it um, uh, more critical, I think, leads us to at least four um, 
substantive questions. Was, this is the question one, was the German unification the central problem of the end of the Cold War? Question two, was Europe and the world really unified? Three, was the end of the Cold War so peaceful? And four, what are the consequences if, if we believe that the war can come to its end without victory and without the defeat? Um, coming to the first conviction, centrality of the, of the German unification in the narratives about the end of the Cold War. I, I, I would like to be uh, understood um, uh, in a proper way, of course, unification of Germany was one of the important problems of the end of the Cold War, especially in the field of security, because it implied substantive questions about the European security architecture after the collapse of the Soviet Union, such as uh, membership of the United Germany in NATO, as the deployment of the American troops uh, on the German soil, as the presence of the nuclear weapons, American nuclear weapons, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in Europe. So obviously, German unification was one of uh, the important problems uh, when it comes to the end of the Cold War. But the question is, should we memorize the end of the Cold War by agreeing about the centrality of a one historical event, one historical moment, as uh, uh, in the case of the uh, German unification, or rather, we should look at the end of the Cold War as the long process, as the long process. And in that sense, I think, um, uh, we can confront uh, two different uh, historical and political narratives about this. The one is from the book uh, by Mary uh, Elise Sarot about, um, about uh, 1989. She starts her book with a very telling sentence. A very short one, don't be worried. On November 9, 1989, the Berlin Wall opened and the world changed. So simple. But we have also in another narrative, uh, for example, in the book by, uh, by um, Friedrich Bösch, Zeitenwende 1979, als die Welt von heute begann, which is, in my view, much more uh, promising and much more comprehensive, certainly, but also much more honest. In that way that uh, what he propose is to, uh, to, to look at the end of the Cold War as a long process started at the turn of the 70s and 80s. And then, of course, we can include in this process many, many events in Europe, in Central Europe, in Europe, and globally as well, which contributed to the end of the Cold War and should be memorized, although they are rather marginalized gradually in the last 30, uh, 30 years. I can just give you some example of this e events. For example, uh, uh, the, 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 the new uh, policy of reforms in, 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 uh, in, in China, uh, war in Afghanistan, Iran revolution, uh, neoliberal uh, revolution in the West, uh, Thatcher, Reagan, Hayek, of course, technological revolution, 
which change warfare communication everything. Um, debt crisis in Latin America, the changes in Africa. And of course, in this chain of events, we should also add the changes in uh, the societies in the Central Eastern European countries, notably uh, Solidarity Movement and Karol Wojtyła elected for Pope. So when, he, when it comes to this question, this, this conviction, we have here two different nar narratives. One which is centered around one historical event, very iconic, very appealing, and another are narratives which try to reconstruct the whole long process which led to the end of the uh, Cold uh, War. And certainly these two ways have quite different implications for uh, 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 taking lessons about the legacy of the Cold War. Uh, of the end of the Cold War. Unification. When it comes to the unification, uh, uh, this uh, idea that the, that the unification of Germany meant also unification of Europe and then globally as a blueprint for the global unification of the world was a very strong political and ideological idea. It was also the essence of the strategy which uh, took uh, Helmut Kohl for the unification of Germany because he wanted to make the unification of Germany the inherent part of the European unification and then also the global unification. And this point of view was obviously strengthened then by the enlargement of NATO, by the enlargement of the European Union, and the global enlarge, enlargement of many other Western structures in the world after the end of the Cold War. This is obvious. But on the other hand, we have an, another story to tell. Because the end of the Cold War caused new kind of systemic asymmetries within Europe and globally as well, new kind of equalities. And for example, when it comes to Europe, the so-called post-communism theory in 90s was such an attempt to give a, 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 a theoretical framework enabling to describe this kind of a new uh, systemic asymmetries as the effect of the, of the end of the Cold War. But we can, as I said, tell the same story globally about the new global asymmetries, new global inequalities, which are directly the consequence of the end of the Cold War. And um, I think that this story is overshadowed by the concept of uh, uh, the end of the Cold War as a start of a unification, as a as a, as a happy end story, if you if 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 you like. Peaceful transformation, the third point. Um, this is a, a very strong idea about the end of the Cold War which uh, brought uh, the peaceful uh, transformation. And this is because of the way how Soviet Union collapsed, of course, which was uh, the, uh, a kind of an implosion, if you like, with some exceptions, of course, of violence. But generally, it was a peaceful, surprisingly peaceful, uh, uh, implosion of the empire. That was uh, this idea of the of the of the of the uh, of the peaceful transformation was also because of the way how the communist regimes ended in the central and eastern uh, uh, countries. 
Um, that was also because there was a strong political interest to keep the, the changes in the framework of the Helsinki process, so without changes of territories and borders, which uh, were obviously um, uh, uh, related to, to possible uh, uh, violence and, 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 and conflicts. And this was because in a very strong ideological approach about, let's say briefly, end of history, end of history, and the entrance in a new post Cold War era without violence, without traditional politics, without wars and so on and so forth. The result? The result is uh, very interesting. The war in the former Yugoslavia disappeared nearly completely from the narratives, European narratives about the end of the Cold War with the exception, of course, of the region, who are the people who remember it very well. But as a part of the story, as a part of the narrative about the end of the Cold War, it has appeared it was just confined to the problems like human rights and ethnic cleansing, very important, of course, problems, but not as a part of the prolongation of the, of the, of the Cold War. And this was, in fact, the war in Yugoslavia, the prolongation of the Cold War. If, if someone is looking for the real roots of the Putin's concept of the foreign policy, also ideological concept, not only geopolitical concept, of the Putin's uh, uh, foreign policy now, should look at uh, war in the former Yugoslavia because uh, it is openly declared by Putin and others, Lavrov and so on, that this was the experience decisive for the formation of this uh, uh, Putin's concept uh, of the foreign uh, policy. Um, I have no time to uh, talk uh, now uh, more about the last um, uh, uh, conviction, about no losers, all, all are the winners, but this had also a very strong impact on, 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 on the narratives about the end of the Cold War. Because uh, uh, the argument was, we should not talk openly about who is the loser and who is the winner, and in the consequence, all were the winners. Um, Summing up, I think uh, these uh, four convictions is, of course, just only the proposal. Um, but I think that, uh, especially now, after 30 years, they should be uh, assessed and examined a little bit more critically, giving some other options for the narratives, making the legacy of the Cold War and on the, of the end of the Cold War, more comprehensive and more complex. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marek. That was um, a really interesting paper. And um, in particular, hopefully Felix or somebody in the audience will bring up around your point about the sort of sidelining of, of the Yugoslav um, wars from, from the memories of the end of the Cold War, which I think is a really um, interesting point. Um, <coughs> thank you as well for, for being very good at timekeeping. Um, <laughs> so now um, we will um, move on to the next um, speaker. But before we do, um, I can see we already have a couple of, or, or one question in Zoom. But please, for those who are joining us online, do feel free to um, to answer, to enter any questions, any any questions or, or comments. But our next speaker is uh, Monica Albrecht from the University of, of Vector, and um, Monica will be speaking about post-colonial memory and Europe-Africa um, relations. Um, 
let me just introduce her though properly as she deserves. Um, Monica Albrecht has been holding, um, has held a variety of positions at the University of Exeter since 2013, both in the Faculty of the Humanities as well of, as of the Social Sciences, showing um, considerable interdisciplinarity. Previously, um, Monica had worked in the same field in the US, the UK, and Ireland. Her main research areas encompass German culture, history, politics, and literature of the 20th and 21st century, in particular, critical post-colonial studies, memory studies, um, and the politics of memory, multiculturalism and migration, uh, multiculturalism and post-colonialism in comparative perspective, um, and history, memory, and minorities um, in literature. As far as her most recent publications are concerned, um, there's been um, one, for example, in um, that was titled Critical Postcolonial Studies, opening up the postcolonial to a broader geopolitical view. Monica, please um, feel free um, to, to begin. Thank you. Perhaps the, the, the does the mic work? Oh. Uh, it's pretty close. <laughs> yeah, it's quite close. <laughs> that better? Oh, yes, that's lots better. Okay, but I think Thank my, my thanks came through anyway. <laughs> uh, for some time now, post-colonial memory has been a major issue, with debates about the Humboldt Forum in Berlin, about the restitution of colonial artifacts uh, and human remains, for, in, for instance, in France and also Germany, or about the toppling of um, uh, monuments associated with colonialism and slavery, for instance, in the United Kingdom and also in the United States, as prominent uh, recent examples. However, these examples rather suggest that post-colonial memory is an important issue, especially in Western European countries. This location of the debate on post-colonial memory is crucial, as the paper aims to shed some critical light on common practices of memory culture and politics in these same Western European countries, including recently on the level of the, of the EU. For when it comes to the post-colonial past and the negotiations on how to deal with it today, the groups and individuals involved, especially those influenced by post-colonial approaches, tend to remain with an all too simple pattern of thought. In the case of colonialism in Africa, for instance, a kind of continent to continent uh, framework prevails, contrasting the former colonizing Europe with the former colonizing Africa. Indeed, whenever scholars or politicians address, and it's a collage of, of quotes now, whenever scholars and politicians address Europe's relationship to its colonial heritage or invoke the increasing geopolitical significance of Europe's colonial past, Europe is basically equated with England and France and while other countries, such as Belgium or Germany, are mentioned uh, at most in passing, Eastern and so Southeastern Europe uh, do not even appear at all in this context. This continent-to-continent -continent framework, largely due to abstraction and certain modes of theorizing, is certainly a gross oversimplification and does not do justice to a complex post-colonial reality. Moreover, uh, this specific approach to coming to terms with the colonial past has several pitfalls in terms of both cultural memory and memory politics. The first point of my discussion on post-colonial memory and Europe-Africa relations is that both, both scholarship and political and public debates on this issue tend to neglect the different positions and uh, uh, interests of the uh, various European countries and conversely equally different uh, African positions vis-a-vis the same colonial past. A second and related point is the issue of a pan-European memory of colonialism as such, which boils down to the question of whether the, such a post-colonial memory is even conceivable on a European level. After all, the European memory landscape is heterogeneous in itself, with different emphasis on the Gulag and the Holocaust in Eastern and Western Europe, 
and neither of these, for example, on the Balkans. Thus, even without the inclusion of colonial history and ideas of homogeneous pan-European communities of memory that emerged after the end of the Cold War, uh, uh, this turned, into, uh, turned out to be largely unrealistic. Nevertheless, post-colonial activities, uh, as uh, conducted by NGOs, politicians, uh, scholars alike, uh, they are calling for the colo colonial uh, uh, legacy to be embedded not only in nas or national but also European memory scapes. Against this background, my paper uh, argues that the notion, notion of post-colonial memory imposed on the European context is highly problematic in that it does not address, let alone adequately deal with, the issues of European landscapes of memory just mentioned. This is all the more valid when problematic ideas about post-colonial memory encounter the real world of contemporary relations between, for instance, Europe and Africa. Subject to the last part of my essay is a dilemma that has already become clearly visible in this context. It revolves around the fact that quite justified uh, critique of colonialism in Africa plays into the hands of actors like China and Russia, uh, since these new global pay players use it as a political tool to legitimize their own actions and convey their to their Af African economic, political, cultural partners, a self-image that is free of a colonial baggage. Uh, before I get started, though, I'm not sure if this is necessary in this context, but I do it anyway. Before I get started, uh, let me point out my critique of post-colonial approaches is, of course, not meant as an attempt to relativize or minimize any kind of colonial wrongdoings. And it does not imply that, that colonial and neo-colonial discourses of power would not exist. My critique is likewise, likewise not aimed at the broad field of the post-colonial as such, from anti-colonial liberation struggles to the still necessary uh, resistance against today's neo-colonial exploitation. It is rather aimed at large parts of post-colonial ideology, its uh, reductive discursive framework and its consequences in, scholarly, in scholarship and society. And one more thing in advance, I'm of course aware that there is no such thing as post-colonial theory or post-colonial studies in the, in the singular, I hear that all the time. Uh, and it's not my intention to lump together the whole uh, uh, manifold, uh, wide field, wrong f uh, and wrongfully make it uniform. For all their differences, however, post-colonial approaches uh, share essential features. And it's only in this respect that I will speak of post-colonialism and of post-colonial approaches or discourses. So let me f first address the more the mostly unreflected post-colonial basic idea of Europe's colonial heritage. And I think Professor uh, Mink at the, uh, at the keynote speech yesterday uh, used the term the stereotype. Uh, I like that. Uh, the post-colonial basic IT idea of Europe's colonial heritage. We owe it lastly, uh, lar largely to post-colonial studies and its, its obsession with the West that for most people today, colonialism is first synonymous with Western colonialism, and second, that colonialism is considered to be a pan-European endeavor and a pan-European heritage. As for the first aspect, post-colonial scholars usually define the characteristics of their field as a, another quote again, as a common political and moral consensus towards the history and legacy of Western colonialism and post-colonial theory, another quote, as that branch of contemporary the uh, theory that investigates and develops propositions about uh, the cul cultural and political impact of European conquest uh, upon colonized societies and the nature of those societies' rep responses. Strangely enough, though, post-colonial studies has managed to establish and normalize to a large degree this idea of colonialism as, the, as an issue exclusively uh, to Western Europe and, and European colonial and imperial powers and, and, and their non-Western and non-European subjects, as if colonies and empires had existed nowhere else. The second problematic aspect of this post-colonial view is that it tends to turn Europe into a kind of homogeneous block of former colonizers, 
Postcolonial studies uh, has established an approach to which all of Europe becomes a single colonial power, equating a handful of countries in Europe with Europe, uh, uh, with Europe as a whole. This simplification is often, often based on the assumption that something called coloniality is inextricably linked to all of Western modernity and accounts for its, quote, darker side, as uh, Walter Mignolo puts it, or uh, the night side, as uh, uh, Achille Bembe quote, the night uh, side uh, of, of uh, European modernity, of course. Uh, the blanket reference to Europe's colonial past ignores or consi uh, considers neg neg uh, negligible the significant parts of Europe never, uh, that significant parts of Europe ne uh, never had colonies. Eastern European countries, by contrast, tend to emphasize this uh, historical fact themselves. For instance, when entering African markets, where it is helpful to, uh, if a colonial legacy is absent and they maintain relative good trade and political relations with African states during the Cold War. Maybe even more uh, important is the con in the context of a post-colonial uh, 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 of colonial power Europe is the fact that some Central and uh, uh, Eastern European countries had a quote now had lived under the yoke of the empire themselves until they regained their independence in 1991 and later. Uh, consequently, the term post-colonial has different meaning in Eastern and Central European landscapes of memory, that was a quote also, than in Western European country, in that it primarily denotes a post-catastrophic and post-socialist uh, situation. People in Eastern and Central Europe thus tend to have a particular sensibility towards hierarchy, uh, uh, and hier uh, hierarchy and neo-colonial elements that, for instance, the EU institution and Western member states may not be aware of. Against this background, the task of post-colonial studies could and should actually be to frame a post-colonial Europe that is not post-colonial as such or as a whole. But this is precisely what, is, what does not happen in the post-colonial horizon of thought considerations for a quasi-neo-colonial power imbalance within Europe and the feeling of those affected is e uh, even more absent. Instead, those who are dealing uh, with this issue work in exactly the opposite direction, aware of the fact that only a few European countries actually had colonies. Some time ago, post-colonial scholars developed the concept of colonialism without colonies. Uh, which is essentially which essentially boils down to the assumption that the formal possession of colonies is not a prerequisite for colonial patterns of thought and behavior. This is part of a larger attempt to place colonialism in the European fabric, as it were, and link it to a pan-European identity, or as the historian Rebecca Habermas put it recently, activists, artists, scholars, many of whom come from former colonies, have recently been calling uh, more and more clearly for Europe to confirm the history and present of colonialism in order to come to, new, uh, to a new understanding what Europe actually is. So, does it make sense to look at nation-state without former colonial possession, possessions from the uh, theoretical perspective of uh, post-colonialism? Countries like Switzerland in the West, for example, or in the East or Southeast, most of uh, or all of these European countries, it does from a post-colonial point of view in that the term post-colonial implies much more than the mere uh, uh, presence of or absence of former colonies. As Shalini Randeria put it, speaking for the vast majority of scholar, uh, scholars in post-colonial studies, quote, we live in a post-colonial world. The assumption implies, by the way, that post-coloniality post in both uh, the, the chronological uh, understanding and in the sense of continuity is a condition that can never end. The idea of colonial continuity can be traced back to Edward Said uh, and his Orientalism of uh, 1978, who, uh, whose generally new approach uh, to the phenomenon was that he replaced the traditional interest-based explanation of colonialism with one that sees the cause of in, in Western culture itself. 
As one of the fiercest critics uh, mocked, uh, according to side, colonialism has its origin in a kind of, quote, compulsive drive inherent in Europe's unitary psyche. In the heyday of post-colonialism in the 90s, this new approach gave rise to tropes such as colonialist mentalities that are circulating to these days. They reverberate, for example, in constantly reiterated insinuations such as still unbroken power and influence of colonial thought patterns and categories in every, everyday life, as well as in, in institutionalized knowledge systems. Uh, whereas scholars more often than not suggest that there has been no progress at all since, colonial, since the colonial era. In short, the assumption is that of a collective potential of the West that produced the colonial enterprise with all its atrocities and ensures that uh, it persists to the present. This post-colonial core idea is simply taken for granted by many and hardly reflected upon anymore. The concept, without, uh, concept of colonialism without colonies fits seamlessly into this broader post-colonial approach. Among the, idea uh, among the ideas developed in this field is, for example, that of colonial complicity. Complicity in a post-colonial reading means participation in the hegemo hegemonic discourses of the West as well as in, in its universalist patterns of thought and practices of domination, as a quote. Uh, again, to avoid any misunderstanding, there is nothing wrong with this if it were only a matter of examining participation or support for colonialism. There may, may be indeed quite a number of individuals or groups in non-colonizing countries uh, who were anything but innocent bystanders in, that, uh, colonial, in these col colonial endeavors. Very often, however, it comes down to the assumption that everything that was produced at the time of colonialism needs to be under general suspicion. And the post-colonial me uh, methods of circular reasoning uh, then consists of searching for something that is taken for granted and assumed and, uh, uh, to be found anyway. When you uh, uh, what you regularly see in such studies is the confirmation and reproduction of premises on which the argument is based in the first place. Postcolonial scholars seldom ask whether these assumptions are actually viable. They ask how exactly can what they assume in the, in the fir in, to be the case anywhere be applied in the respective uh, 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 object of investigation. Thus questions such as, is there such a thing as colonial imaginary also in Switzerland, is a mere rhetorical question and the result is predictable from the outset. In this way, one European country after the other can be and has been actually included in the frame framework of post-colonial thinking. And in a sense, the European Union seems to be jumping on this post-colonial bandwagon in the 2021 20, uh, New Africa strat strategy and is calling for a uh, quote for the EU and Africa, continent to continent, to establish uh, a memorial culture which allows both continents to identify remnants of colonial rule in current relations and negotiate appropriate measures to, uh, to counteract them. This was the uh, uh, quote from the official uh, New Africa strategy. Uh, Postcolonial studies claim for themselves that they offer a more inclusive, more global stories, collage of quotes again, and that, they, uh, and that their central premises and key concept could be, uh, should be able to charge the worldwide contemporary condition. However, if one takes a step back and adopts a truly global perspective, actors, uh, other actors like China, Russia, India, Turkey, Saudi Arabia uh, come into view who have uh, their own great interest in, uh, in controlling the post-colonial narratives. China and other global players, as quote now, uh, are ahead by nose in the, received, in the renewed uh, global battle uh, for African resources and they ask diplomatic support for African states at the United Nations. <coughs> 
and it is safe to assume that they very much approve of the post-colonial condemnation of the West. They are also likely to be in favor of what political scientist uh, Jonathan Bach has found in, in a review of recent research, namely that many post-colonial scholars, activists, seek to fix Western debts and obligation indefinitely into the future as a kind of default position. One more. Uh, or more generally, a uh, post-colonial critique of colonialism, however justified, of course, plays into the hands of, a new, of new global actors. They, they can and they do use it as a political uh, tool to legitimize their own action and give their African partners in business, po in politics, culture, an embellished image of their own norms and values, free of colonial baggage. And, yep, last page. Uh, half, half, half a page on <laughs> free, of, free of colonial uh, baggage. Uh, if these glo global actors uh, uh, use and misuse post-colonial memory to undermine the relations between Europe and Africa, much more thought needs to be given to the re uh, relationship between what may be academically and theoretically desirable and the unintended negative consequences of certain normative post-colonial assumptions. I can think I... Uh, I think I, I can leave the last Thank you very much, Monica, for your thought-provoking presentation. Um, we're now going to go um, online to... Uh, well. We're already online, but <laughs> our next speaker is online, would be a better way of phrasing it, um, to, to Paula Ryan Fisher, who is currently working on the Memocracy Project, um, which looks at the challenge of populist memory politics for Europe towards effective responses to militant legislation on the past. And this is part of a, of a research consortium between the Asse Institute in The Hague, the University of Copenhagen, the Polish Academy of Sciences here in Warsaw, and the University of Cologne, um, where, where Paula is based. Paula is also a reporter for the Oxford Reports on International Law in Domestic Courts and an alumna of the German um, Academic Scholarship Foundation. Um, today, Paula will be speaking, um, the title of Paula's paper is Ahead to the Past, How the Future Will Govern Memory of the Past. Um, Paula, I hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> I hope you can hear me. Yes, yes, we can hear you wonderfully. Thank you. <laughs> Many things. I will try to uh, share my screen so that you can see my presentation. So, I hope this works. Yes. Wait, it's, okay, perfect. We just need uh, it in animation view. Um, exactly. So, here we go. Many, many thanks. Um, I, uh, first of all, I apologize for not being in Warsaw. Um, I had really planned to come and my flights had been booked. And uh, in the end, it was some health issue that, that prevented me to come. So I'm very, very sorry for that. Um, but I'm, I'm excited to follow the um, con con uh, conference uh, from, from home office. Uh, so yeah, very, very uh, pleased to be here today. So my presentation <clears throat> is, as you said before, um, about the future of a governing memory of the past. And uh, with this, I um, would like to say that I am a little bit, um, I would say, of the minority here, because I'm not a not an historian, I'm not a political scientist, but I'm a, I'm a lawyer from my background. So my um, paper is also um, a little bit more legal than, um, than uh, historical. Um, so First of all, what do I mean by governing of memory by law? Um, and I added by law, although this is not on the title because most of my um, provisions that I actually talk about are um, legal provisions. So we see in Russia laws, a law prohibiting the denial of facts related to the Red Army's actions during the Second World War. So we are not allowed in Russia to deny <coughs> any um, uh, any, um, or actually to, to, uh, to, to state that there had been uh, uh, Red Army's um, crimes uh, during the Second World War committed. And the second law in 2021 um, was passed on the heroic role of Russia in the Great Patriotic War, as the war is called there. To give you another example of a different region, in Turkey we have Article 301 of the Criminal Code, and this article um, 
uh, is uh, about the degrading of the Turkish nation. And it um, actually covers the critique, um, which argues that Turkey committed a genocide against Armenians in 1915 until 1917. What do these laws um, have in common? So memory laws, as these laws that I, that I presented to you, are legal means inscribing an official interpretation of the historical event into law. And um, I assume that most of you will be familiar with this concept. It has been um, more or less invented um, in France under the term loi mémorielle and um, conceptualized especially for the um, loi Gesso, which uh, was the prohibition of the Holocaust denial. And um, so originally this laws, these laws have actually been used in a very different way. So namely states wanted to adopt laws banning precisely the denial of certain historical crimes and not um, revisioning their own history in a more positive way than it actually was. So, um, you uh, might be aware of, as I said, bans of denial of, for example, Nazi crimes, as I just said, but also the denial of Soviet crimes, as we see in a lot of um, post-Soviet states, um, <clears throat> and uh, also laws uh, prohibiting the denial of Ar the Armenian genocide. And the phenomenon of memory laws has, as you most likely know, increasingly raised attention by scholars in recent years. However, what in my view remains underexplored and what I, um, I'm exploring in my pa paper is the question of how the mnemonic landscape is expected to change in the future, so 20 years from now, let's say, and what legal challenges, especially, as I said, my background is legal, um, what legal challenges result from these, cha um, these um, changes. So this is the research question. I have identified three major factors. Um, that I uh, consider to be most likely to change this mnemonic landscape. The first is that we are going to face new atrocities, which will pose the question of how these new atrocities will be remembered, and in particular, whether the memory of them will be protected against denialism, as is the case for the Holocaust, and also as we see, um, uh, as we saw uh, for, for Soviet crimes in, in particular countries, in certain countries. Um, so this is my first changing factor. The second factor in my view is the entry into the post-factual age that we have already been witnessing and that leads to some considerable changes in my view. And then third, we see more or less a privatization of memory laws. And I will explain um, what I mean by this um, in a minute. So let's turn to the first of these changes, the, um, the, the current and future new atrocities. As you, um, as you know, traditionally, Memory politics in Europe, especially um, in the European Union, but also in the Council of Europe, have been uh, focusing especially on, um, on Nazism and communism. So we see a lot of resolutions where, um, where the uh, Council of Europe and also the European Union adopted resolutions explicitly um, commemorating the uh, crimes of Nazism and then after, um, after the fall of the Soviet Union also of communism. <clears throat> However, in my view, new atrocities are already at the horizon and not only at the horizon, we see um, with the uh, war of aggression in Ukraine and against Ukraine that new major atrocities are already being committed today. And I'm, in my view, they are very likely to be <coughs> committed in the future as well. So the question is, <coughs> could and need their denial also be criminalized? And um, so in my view, we need to distinguish two things. Um, first of all, we have, um, legally speaking, in some cases, an obligation to criminalize. On the other hand, we have um, the question whether if a country wants to criminalize a certain denial of a certain historical crime, whether it is actually um, in the position to do so or whether it would um, uh, infringe upon um, uh, uh, European um, legal values. So first of all, on the obligation to criminalize. The relevant standards here mainly result from an EU framework decision on combating racism and xenophobia of 2008. And the interesting aspect about this binding uh, framework decision, so it is a binding framework decision and not only um, a soft law instrument, the, the interesting aspect about this is that it does not only relate to the Holocaust denial, but it, that it makes obligatory also the ban on denial of genocide more generally, and also crimes against humanity and also war crimes. So everything that we see being committed in, um, in uh, Ukraine today, at least under certain circumstances. 
and I cannot enter into the details, but under certain circumstances, the denial of these, um, these crimes, these historical crimes, must be um, criminalized um, under European law. So the question now is, of course, whether the crimes being committed today, especially those in Ukraine, actually enter into this definition. I see two problems with this. So one problem is um, that in order for the denialism to be criminal under this framework decision, the historical crime must be directed against a group, a member um, defined by race, um, a religion, descent, national um, or ethnic origin. So um, the question that arises from here in, in my view is on the problem, and the, 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 I would say the small problem that I see with this is that unlike with, for example, the Holocaust, it seems that the overall and ultimate goal of Russia at the moment is not is to attack Ukrainians for their ethnic and national origin, um, is, is actually not this, but it's rather to annex the country. Still, I would argue that the framework decision does not require the direction against groups by reference to their ethnic or national origin to be the ultimate goal. In my view, rather, even in a case of a bundle of motives, as we see um, today, the crime may still fall under the definition of the framework decision, at least unless the racial and discriminatory component becomes completely um, <clears throat> negle neglectable or subsidiary to other goals. So in my view, the framework decision would actually be like um, uh, apt to cover these new crimes. Um, however, a second problem, and this is maybe surprising to some of you, the elephant in the room today, so the crime of aggression, so the actual crime that Russia um, is, is committing today against, against Ukraine, is not covered by the framework decision. And this, um, the reason for this is very simple. Um, the framework decision was adopted before the crime of aggression had actually entered into force. So, um, so, so much on the, on the obligation to criminalize. Now, how about states which want to criminalize the denial of crimes, but that may be uh, prevented from doing so by European law? So with this, the relevant standards here mainly flow from Article 10 um, of the European Convention on Human Rights, which is the article for freedom of expression, and the relevant case law of the European Court of Human Rights. I cannot enter into the details here, but I would like to stress at least one case, which is the case Perenczek versus Switzerland, and some of you may have heard of it. Um, so it's a, case, um, it's a case on the Armenian genocide where the court found, um, so it was a, um, it was a case um, where, a, um, uh, where a Turkish politician was um, <clears throat> denying, at least legally denying um, the fact that um, the, the Armenian genocide, so the, so the um, genocide um, by the Ottoman Empire against Armenians. And um, at least he denied the fact that this, if these events could be legally qualified as, in, as a genocide. And the court found that the conviction by the Swiss authorities of this person um, for denial of genocide, because the Swiss provisions were very broad already, um, uh, so that this conviction was contrary to the European Convention of Human Rights because it violated Article 10. So Mr. Pedencek was allowed to deny legally the um, qualification of the events um, uh, uh, as a genocide. So, um, and, and the reasoning with, for this, the court found that um, what was missing was a geographical or a historical link between the country which criminalizes the denial and the historical event as such. And um, because Switzerland had no relationship, no direct relationship historically, um, geographically, also time-wise, um, because so much time had already, been, had already passed, um, so that the, the missing link led to the conclusion that Switzerland was not allowed to criminalize the applicant for having denied the Armenian genocide. On this basis, oh, on this basis, I would argue that the denial of currently and maybe in the future committed crimes by Russia would not be possible, at least in those countries which do not have this historical and geographical connection. For example, let's take a state like Portugal. And um, Portugal is, is geographically quite, quite apart from, from Ukraine and from Russia. And um, it is not a country which, for example, like Poland, I mean, there's of course a close uh, geographical connection already, but also not uh, taking um, uh, a great, a particularly great number of ref refugees so that we cannot see that there's a close connection to the conflict. Um, so the question that follows from here is the following. Of course, the fact that not all um, crimes 
being committed today could be legally denied um, from uh, the, on the basis of what I've been saying so far. Of course, this does not mean that we need to introduce bans on denial because bans on denial are problematic as such. So the question which follows from this, this is the following. Should memory laws be diversified so as to conclude new atrocities? Um, and with this, we enter into a similar debate which arose during and after the Perinchek case. So against this diversification of existing memory laws, we can argue that it is not actually for the legislator or for the judges to rule on history, but it's rather the task of, um, of I would say many of you, of the task of historians. And of course, democracy rely, uh, requires us to be able to debate openly and to research openly on history without being restricted too much by bans on denialism. Similarly, we could say, um, we could say that we enter a slippery slope for as soon as we admit the ban on denialism on certain historical crimes, like for example, for the Shoah, it becomes difficult to refuse the same protection to victims of other historical crimes. And uh, we see that with, uh, with many crimes, we see that with um, colonial crimes, and we see that um, with, um, at least in Germany, what we call the second historian dispute, um, which, uh, which is still going on, and which is about the question whether of our unique or I would say major focus on the Shoah and the remembrance of the Shoah is legitimate. On the other hand, there are also some reasons, in my view, um, uh, which are somehow um, somehow neglected in the de debate and that speak in favor of a certain diversification of memory laws. Although I don't want to, want to be understood as if I generally favor a much broader restriction of discourse on history, I think that many critiques of denial bans oversee important factors. And this is why I want to raise these issues here. So first of all, there's no need to protect deliberately made false statements. And many authors, in my view, appear um, to ignore this because um, these deliberately made false statements, they don't um, have any value for the debate. Rather, they remove the basis of the debate and the risk of a chilling effect on true statements, which is, which is of course the reason why we are careful with restricting even false statements. I think this risk could be prevented, at least reduced, by the requirement of the actor acting deliberately. So a person needs to act deliberately in order to be um, to may be criminalized. Um, and with this, I think the chilling effect on true statements could be um, could be reduced significantly. And then second, most denial bans are akin to a general incitement to hatred. And um, because they often require in, in the legal um, qualification of the, of the relevant crimes that the denial is likely to incite to hatred. Um, so in my view, um, the, uh, the outrage that we witness with many bans on denialism is exaggerated because it is quite similar, this offense to the general offense of incitement to hatred, which we don't um, really uh, um, ra raise any questions about. Um, of course, the more difficult question is, um, and I cannot answer it here in, in, this, in this short presentation, is whether denial ban should also be possible without requiring that um, the action is likely to incite to hatred. <clears throat> so um, to sum it up, certainly the EU and the COE, the Council of Europe member states should not be obliged to expand existing denial bans beyond the existing framework decision, which I have presented to you. However, I think we could at least consider whether they should not be allowed to introduce further reaching denial bans. Um, and uh, I want to use this, um, this uh, uh, presentation here to just um, inform you about a relevant uh, change of law in, uh, in Germany, which occurred just last week, where the parliament adopted quite um, clandestinely uh, um, a new um, reform. And we have now in Germany a law which prohibits the denial also generally of genocide and also of um, crimes against um, uh, uh, humanity and war crimes. Um, and uh, so we have, in fact, diversified now the memory landscape, um, and the reason was precisely the um, implementation of this uh, framework decision of the EU, um, and there was even an infringement procedure against Germany going on so far, and this is now a way to, um, to uh, prevent this infringement procedure from further going on. So this was the first uh, changing aspect, and as I have only um, uh, five more minutes, 
I want to uh, very briefly come back to the uh, two other aspects that we see. So um, this, I will be much more brief here. So first of all, the entry into the post-factual age. In my view, we see an increasing relativization of truth through first misinformation as a strategy of national and international politics, but also um, through new technology. Um, so we see this with a deep fake, um, uh, fake fakes, where um, uh, especially um, IR is, um, I, uh, IA is used for, um, for creating a fake information. And um, my, one may, um, I think this is just a provoc provocative claim I wanted to raise here, one may ask whether not also critical theory to some extent, or at least a misuse of critical theory, also contributes to a certain relativization of truth. Um, what are the possible effects on, uh, on law? So in my view, we have different possible scenarios here. Um, the first is that states, in view of this relativ relativization of truth, may simply capitulate and align to the era of post-truth. So um, memory uh, of the truth would not be protected anymore. What I consider it, however, is more likely is a second and opposite scenario. The increasing relativization of truth might also lead to an increase of the value of collective memory. And um, uh, I mean, you're familiar with this term. Uh, this term has been um, especially introduced in anthropology and philosophy. And um, the idea is that since we see that truth is more, of, more and more becoming under pressure, um, this could lead to the fact that co the, co the collective memory would become more and more precious in, view of, um, in, view, in the view of uh, legislators. And one could spin the scenario even further and argue that not only the value of collective memory will increase, but even that a right to memory would be emerging. And this right has been discussed by some scholars already, although many aspects remain very unclear. Um, thus, though this right does not seem to have come into existence already, at least it is not recognized to this extent, it is possible in my view um, to think that in the future, state may have a duty to refrain from denying certain historical crimes themselves, but they may also have a duty to protect memory of the people from attacks by other private individuals. So they would have a positive obligation to protect the memory within private, uh, between privates. And finally, one could even argue that a state is not only helped refra to refrain from denial, but also to positively acknowledge its past crimes. So I, I'm, I'm construing this, um, this three-step level, level um, a concept. All this, I think, in my view, will be the subject of, of future debates. And then very briefly on the um, promised uh, privatization of memory laws, what do I mean by this? Well, due to the shift of communication to social media and the widespread practice of denial on social media, many social platforms have already started to actually govern memory through their moderation policies. Um, and we see that, for example, with Facebook, we see that with Instagram and also, um, uh, also Twitter, that they all prohibit in one way or the other the denial of the Holocaust. Not um, it, it, this is different for Telegram, which does not um, uh, um, lead or do a lot of um, uh, um, moderation policies. Um, however, these moderation policies are problematic in themselves because they have already identified. Um, we have already identified the risk of state memory laws, and this risk, of course multiplies once we have a private actor involved because this private actor is without any democratic legitimation. Um, an additional challenge in my view results from the EU Digital Services Act and um, um, I will be very brief here. So this act foresees that platforms are liable for illegal content which is not then removed expeditiously after gaining knowledge of it. And um, so that act defines what is an illegal in content, uh, which says any information which in itself or by its reference to activity is not in compliance with union law or the law of a member state. And in my view, this definition raises many problems with regard to memory laws because, um, because uh, if certain memory laws exist only in one given member state, is it then only to be deleted in this state? The European Commission in a working sheet says yes. Um, however, I don't think that this is clear from the definition and I, I think that um, if platforms are allowed to, um, to be stricter in their private memory policies than they are, um, than the state um, policies are, which is at least the case um, uh, for, the, for the German um, uh, legal uh, situation. So 
So the courts allow private platforms to be stricter on the content than uh, what state uh, law would, provi would provide. Um, in that case, I think it is very likely that platforms in case of diverging memory laws will always choose the stricter standard and apply globally a stricter memory laws. This, however, would lead to a globalization of private memory um, policies, which would more and more become disconnected from the collective Please memory as such. Yes, and I will I will conclude. Okay, you um, have heard. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> and I will conclude. So just to sum it up, I think these new atrocities might lead to a greater diversification of memory laws. Second, the entry into the post-factual age um, will increase the value of a collective memory and even possibly um, uh, make emerge a right to memory. And then, uh, lastly, this privatization of memory laws will also um, uh, raise important problems and even uh, lead to challenges for our democracy. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Now breathe. <laughs> Thank you very much, Paula, for, especially for the very concise conclusion, impressively concise. Um, now, our next speaker um, is Harutian Mar Marutian, um, and he will be speaking about how the Holocaust um, is part of universal memory, while the Armenian genocide um, is not. Um, Harutian, sorry, Harutian, um, is a social cultural anthropologist, the director of the um, Armenian Genocide Museum Institute Foundation, head researcher at the Department of Contemporary Anthropological Studies um, of the Institute of Archaeology and Ethnography um, at the National Academy of Sciences of Armenia. He received his first PhD at the Institute of Ethnography Academy of Sciences of the USSR in Moscow and his second PhD um, in 2007 at the Institute of Archaeology and Ethnography in, in Yerevan. Uh, his research interests encompass various topics, as possibly could be suspected by the fact he has two PhDs, um, such as Armenian genocide memory, national identity transformation, modern national movements, iconography, um, into alia, traditional Armenian um, culture and poverty. Haritian is the author of three monographs, um, as well as a contributor to, to five collective monographs. And um, just to add an even further to his impressiveness and, and, and um, increasingly po possibly everybody else's inferiority complex, he's offered more <laughs> than 130 scholarly articles. And so um, on that, let me hand over so we can hear, hear the latest. The title, as you heard, why the Holocaust is, uh, yes. uh, why, uh, the Holocaust is a part of universal memory, while, while the Armenian genocide is not. It is no secret that the memory of the Holocaust uh, has been, uh, for many decades, one of the most important parts of world memory. The Armenian genocide, which in terms of structure and implementation preceded the Holocaust in many ways, does not receive similar treatment. So why are the reasons? And I will stress on the six to seven factors only. The first, territorial inclusion and collective and historical memory factors relating to the implementation of the Armenian Genocide and the Holocaust. During the Armenian Genocide years, 1.5 million, almost two thirds of the Armenian population of 2.4 to 2.5 million people living in the Ottoman Empire were brutally murdered or died of hunger and starvation during their forced exile. Some who remained alive were forcibly converted to Islam, others migrated to Eastern Armenia, and several hundred thousand were scattered around the world, laying the foundation of the Armenian diaspora. The first Republic of Armenia, 1918-1920, was created on only one-tenth of the people's historic homeland. The number of Jews who, who perished uh, in the Holocaust was over six million, about two thirds of those inhabiting Europe or one third of the Jews worldwide. This might mean that if in the case of Armenians, the number of genocide survivors that settled in Western and Middle Eastern countries other than their motherland was about half a million, then the number of Jews who settled under the same circumstances might be about three million. These numbers are only approximate, as in both cases, there were later mass migrations, uh, repatriations of these settled communities to their newly founded countries' states. 
It is also true that in both cases, the survivors as a rule refused to share their experiences with, the, uh, with their descendants and other people for some time, from several years to several decades, and in some instances, until the end of their lives. Still, when the memories of the atrocities became more understandable to the public at large, the people presenting them were qualitatively different. The Armenian genocide took place uh, in the Ottoman Empire, that is to say, within one state. Two states, Turkey and Syria, were later created in the area where the mass killings and deportations of Armenians had taken place. Some parts of the latter's territory had been exceptional death marches and concentration campsites. The mass killing of Jews mostly occurred in Central and Eastern European countries occupied by or under Nazi Germany's influence, as well as on the Soviet Union's territory. Jews doomed to destruction were, however, brought to the concentration camps and sites of mass destruction created in those countries, as well as from the other European countries the Nazis had conquered. In many countries, special units had been organized to kill Jews, but in several cases, this was carried out by local forces. If estimates were made in this way, then the boundaries of the Holocaust directly or indirectly included 17, now 25, European countries. Another thing to be noted is that for a part of the European population, in particular the people in France and Greece, the development of collective memory about the Armenian genocide was conditioned by contact solely with the survivors, refugees. The Armenian refugees were in reality also victims of World War I, but from a region outside the European theater of war. In the case of uh, the Holocaust, World War II is part of the history of almost all European countries. Millions of people had come directly face to face into contact with fascism and Nazism. War had been part of their day-to-day -day life for at least five to seven years, and their relatives, friends, neighbors, acquaintances, and many others had fallen victim to it. This was sure to influence, in one way or another, the creators of historical memory, journalists, historians, writers, artists, and others. In the case of uh, Armenian genocide victims, the message in the case of Armenian genocide victims, the message was mediated by stories of refugees speaking a strange language. In the case of the Jewish Holocaust, the message came directly from their immediate milieu. The independent state factor. In the Armenian genocide case, a significant number of survivors migrated to the Russian Empire where, towards the end of World War I, the First Republic of Armenia was founded in May 1918. It lasted for two and a half years until December 1920 and perished as a result of the joint military attacks made by the Kemalist Turks and Bolshevik Russians. The Second Republic of Armenia, 1920 to 1991, was part of the Soviet Union and was, about many uh, uh, questions, deprived of conducting an independent policy. Turkey, the country that had perpetrated the genocide, had signed a treaty of friendship with Russia, USSR, that lasts uh, from 1921 until today. Talk of uh, the genocide gradually ceased after the establishment of the Soviet regime in Armenia on December 2, 1920. Discussion of Turkish-Armenian antagonism was not encouraged. In the years of Stalin's dictatorship, any talk about the Metz Yegern or uh, Armenian genocide and Western Armenia would be viewed as a manifestation of nationalism and was punished by imprisonment, exile, or execution by shooting. The situation started to change gradually in the second half of 1950s due to the Khrushchev thaw and culminated in mass demonstrations in Yerevan on April uh, 24, 1965, the 15th anniversary of the genocide. It was only in 1988 that Armenia confirmed uh, April 24 as Genocide Victims Commemoration Day. The genocide issue was also included in the Armenian Declaration of Independence, promulgated on August 23, 1990, which was in a way also a declaration of a course in the foreign policy of Armenia, whereby the Armenian Genocide became one of the pillars of the Armenian identity today. <laughs> 
Several hundred thousand Jewish survivors settled in the state of Israel, which was established three years after the end of World War II. They actively engaged in Israel's newly created and developing society, and in about two decades, the Holocaust memory became one of the central components of Israel's national identity. Israel's Knesset decided in 1953 to declare a Holocaust Martyrs and Heroes Remembrance Day. The Yad Vashem, uh, the Holocaust Martyrs and Heroes Remembrance Authority Memorial Complex with an accompanying museum was founded in the same year. In the case of Armenia, active discussions on the genocide in fiction as well as historiography began to appear some 40, 50 years after the genocide began in 1915. The first official visits made by the authorities to the genocide memorial complex happened 60 years after and the genocide became a political factor 75 years after 1915. Also, the first museum was founded only 80 years after the genocide. For the Armenians, a basic reason might have been the lack of an independent state. Uh, it is characteristic that uh, the USSR never officially recognized the, Arme uh, the genocide, which, among other factors, prevented independent internal and foreign policies. Recognition and reparation factors. Great Britain, France, and Russia issued a joint statement regarding the deportation and massacres of the Armenian population of the Ottoman Empire on May 24, 1915, just one month after the beginning of the Armenian genocide. Uh, the three allied Entente states declared that the Turkish government was responsible for that crime against the Armenians. The statement used for the first time in the international political and diplomatic field the phrase, a crime against humanity and civilization. The trials of the leading figures of the government, uh, of, the governing, of the governing Union and Progress Young Turk Party, which involved the Ottoman Empire in the First World War and organized the deportation and genocide of Armenians, took place in 1919-1920 in Istanbul and several other cities. Only eight people were sentenced to death, mostly in absentia. Some went to prison and others were released. Although the Young Turks trial did not receive a wide response, it nevertheless confirmed the genocide of the Armenian people that had been perpetrated by the Turkish authorities. The Armenian genocide was considered forgotten for many decades. The USSR never raised issues uh, relating to it uh, on any international platform. Armenian historiography began the study of the Armenian genocide from the second half of the 1950s onwards, and it was approached as follows. Under Turkish denialist policy, the tendency was to prove the reality of the uh, genocide by presenting new facts and putting them into circulation. The ensuing result was the fact that the problem of genocide, looking at the issue from one side, seems to have remained in the field as an ethnic conflict only. This means that in most works dedicated to the Armenian genocide, the emphasis is mainly on the slaughter and mass destruction of the Armenians, the victims, by the Turks, the perpetrators. In turn, the proving approach used in Armenia's foreign policy culminated in the international recognition of the Armenian genocide. The process of international recognition began only just before the 50th anniversary of the genocide, with initially Uruguay, 1965, and Cyprus, 1975, officially recognizing it. After Armenia gained its independence in 1991, approximately 30 more states and many international organizations officially recognized the Armenian genocide as well. The Republic of Turkey did not recognize the Armenian genocide and continues its politics of denial to this day. No discussions with the Turkish side concerning compensation may be held under such conditions. The end of the Second World War was followed by the occupation of Germany by the victorious Allied powers. A series of conferences were subsequently held, in which, among many decisions made relating to post-war Europe, the forms and amounts of war reparations to be paid by Germany were decided. 
Federal Chancellor Konrad Adenauer said in an official statement made in September 1951 that Germany was ready to pay reparations for Nazi crimes. So, and uh, the uh, claims conference was formed and the whole world knows that Germany, one of the most powerful states in the world, has been paying reparations to Jewry in various uh, ways for decades. The payments also contribute to the growth of interest in the Holocaust, as well as towards the study of the phenomenon of compensation. Ideological factor. A significant number of researchers have for several decades stressed not the guilt of Germans as an ethnic group for the Holocaust, but have concentrated on the culpability of Nazism and racism as ideological concepts instead. That is, the, uh, they don't attribute ethnic uh, characteristics to the conflict that took place in the past, but see it only as the result of implementing an ideology of a criminal nature. In the case of the study of the Armenian genocide, the Turkish denial and partial international recognition do not permit the genocide issue to move from the ethnic sphere uh, to that of ideology. In other words, to present the genocidal acts committed as a manifestation of the Young Turks ideology. In other words, researchers of the Armenian genocide have not sufficiently studied and emphasized the point that uh, Turkism and Pan-Turkism that the Young Turks promoted during the First World War were in many ways the same as the Nazism that prepared the Second World War. In my opinion, these factors create complications for the Armenian side when talking uh, to the world. They lessen interest in the Armenian genocide to some extent, reduce uh, the perception of its political demand, and prevent its presentation as part of the universal catastrophe caused by a misant uh, misanthropic ideology, which, like the Jewish Holocaust, led to the destruction of millions of people. The museum factor. The above mentioned factor becomes more important when the issue of the number and location of museums in the world dedicated to the Holocaust and the Armenian genocide is analyzed. In 2022, the total number of museums and exhibitions throughout the world, both temporary and permanent, devoted to the Jewish Holocaust totaled uh, 63. There are 93 Jewish museums worldwide, most of which definitely touch on the subject of the Holocaust. By contrast, the only museum with a research institute dedicated to the Armenian Genocide is the Armenian Genocide Museum Institute in Yerevan. There is a small exhibition section dedicated to the Armenian Genocide in the Museum of History of Armenia, also in Yerevan. A museum dedicated to Armenian orphans near Beirut has been open uh, for several years. The Ararat Eskijan Museum in Los Angeles and the Armenian Museum of America in Boston both have sections dedicated to the Armenian Genocide. A third of the museums dedicated uh, to the Holocaust are located in Europe and excluding the United Kingdom where there are two. The other 12 countries were occupied during the Second World War or were within the Third Reich's sphere of influence. About 40% of the total number of uh, museums are located in the USA. The, uh, the reason is not necessarily only because there is a large and influential Jewish diaspora community there. In his monograph devoted to the creation of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, Edward Linenthal used the following idea in his first sentence. The Holocaust became an event officially incorporated into Armenian memory, end of quote. In other words, uh, did I show it? No. No. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, an attempt was made to raise the tragedy of a deeply national nature concerning an ethnic community beyond the borders of ethnicity and present it to the world as an evil of international level. In the case of the Armenian genocide, however, the Armenian side has been unable to present the problem as being international. This was because the basis of the totalitarian system formed in the Ottoman Empire was also the ideology of Turkism 
and pan-Turkism containing many racist elements. The diaspora factor. The existence uh, of a museum dedicated to the Holocaust as well as a large or small monument or memorial complex indicates to some extent the community's cohesion, activity, organizational level, and ultimately its power. It may seem paradoxical, but an announcement made about the creation of a museum and subsequent activities aimed to do so may lead to an increase of the, in the community's activity and organization. Finally, if uh, there is an appropriate ideological basis, financial support for the museum's activities will often go beyond narrow community bounds and also include citizens of the given state, either through individual philanthropy or budgetary appropriations from state taxation. The Jewish diaspora is about 2,500 years old, while the Armenian diaspora has existed for a little more than 100 years. It is only natural that the Jewish diaspora has developed for centuries a way of integrating into host societies, while at the same time creating a unique culture to maintain uh, its own identity. Alongside numerous similarities, qualitative differences may also be noted, the most notable of which, in my opinion, is the skill of using culture as a weapon. In the case of the Armenian diaspora, at least until recently, uh, much more attention was paid uh, to con uh, constructing churches and organizing schools. Integration into the host country through culture by making Armenian cultural heritage part of that country's own is, however, still significantly inferior to the Jewish experience. One result of this is that political decisions made in the host countries in favor of Armenia through political lobbying, but the memory of the Armenian genocide does not become part of the memory of the peoples among which diaspora Armenians live. Uh, it is not realized that even relatively financially weak diasporas, when setting relatively high aims, may be able to spread, I'm not using the word propaganda, cultural diplomacy, unite, become strong, and finally solve their problems. The host state usually, uh, in such cases, support serious cultural undertakings, seeing them as a means to integrate minorities into its society. Instead of creating museums, the Armenian diaspora communities prefer to erect monuments, not with usual understandable and acceptable designs uh, for the given society, but strictly of an Armenian-oriented nature. Meanwhile, the cultural and ideological value of a museum is comparatively much greater than that of a monument. Museum exhibitions provide information in a much more systematic manner. And the last, the education teaching factor. Due to above mentioned factors, uh, first, the Holocaust is part of collective memory in me, uh, many European countries. Second, there is a huge amount of specialist and fictional literature as well as films about the Holocaust in many languages. Third, there are more than 55,000 digitized Holocaust survivor interviews that have enormous significance as sources. Fourth, the Holocaust is presented as being the result of the totalitarian, misanthropic, Nazi ideologically racist system. Fifth, the Holocaust is recognized by the perpetrators and their descendants, and reparations continue in various forms until today. Sixth, uh, there are dozens of museums dedicated to the Holocaust where exhibitions are organized in widely used international languages. Seventh, there are dozens of university chairs and research centers dedicated to the Holocaust, etc. It is also no coincidence uh, that the Holocaust has a permanent place in the school curricula of dozens of countries. I cannot say that uh, uh, the above mentioned factors are present in the same way and scale in the, in the case of the Armenian Genocide. In the Republic of Armenia school education system, the Armenian Genocide uh, in the Republic of Armenia school education system, the Armenian genocide is taught in the context of the First World War. Uh, 
taking up only two lessons. Recently, there has been a tendency to devote more time to the Armenian genocide topic in the higher education system and new school education programs are being developed. The goal is not so much to impart historical knowledge, but to go from um, the present to the past, to capitalize uh, on the experiences of the past in the present, and to create a young generation that carries not just symbolic knowledge, but a certain ideology. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now let's go to our next um, speaker, our final speaker, who's also joining us from online, um, Christoph Teubner, who is currently and has been since April 2021 a research assistant at the Chair of Modern and Contemporary History at the University of Bonn in Germany. Christoph today will be delivering a paper on A Clash of Memories, the impact of memory and history on the diplomatic relationships between West Germany and the Arab states following the commencement of West German-Israeli relations in 1965. Christoph, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and I hope uh, everyone can hear me. Um, thank you for your kind introduction and uh, the invitation to this interesting conference. Um, I'm really sorry that I can't be there due to personal reasons. Um, I try to share my presentation. I hope can, uh, everybody can see it. Um, at first glance, the severance of relations uh, with the Federal Republic of Germany by most Arab states on May 13th, 1965, is not associated with any aspect of remembrance policy um, whatsoever. However, a closer look reveals that memory and history are central elements in the erosion of relations, the diplomatic dispute, and um, also the normalization of relationship of the relationship later on. The prehistory and the diplomatic dispute up to the restitution of relations, which, depending on the country, stretched into the mid-1970s, is characterized by a framework of history and memory politics that brings together different levels of reference to the past and contributes to the escalation in the case of conflict. Three main uh, questions arise here. First, which levels of memory and perspectives on the past are reflected in the di diplomatic dispute and have an impact on the relations? Second, which actors occupy themes and narratives? And third, how do both issues develop under the assumption of relations and why? In order to answer these questions, diplomatic resources from the political archive of the Federal Foreign Office in Berlin were used and examined from a discourse historical perspective in order to be able to examine the construct character of the use of memory and the past in international politics. The most obvious, but not the only uh, level of memory in, in the di diplomatic exchange between Western Germany and the Arab states is that of the Holocaust. It is to be separated from, the gen from general images of the history of the Second World War and will have to be seen as the most important point for the interpretation of events in the Middle East for both sides. The interpretation and commentary on the relationship between the Federal Republic and Israel is a central topos in diplomatic communication between Arab states and West Germany. Memory and its evaluation is thus not only a topic of diplomatic debate, but also an interpretive link between the past and current problems. In the view of the Arab interlocutors, the Federal Republic as the successor state responsible for the atrocities of National Socialism is seen as biased, dishonest and unbalanced with regard to its foreign policy actions. At the same time, Germany is held partly responsible for the current situation in the Middle East. On one hand, the Arab side sees the Holocaust as a catalyst for Zionist aspirations, while on the other hand, Germany's pro-Israeli foreign policy summons the post-war order in the Middle East. On this point, another level of the past, it becomes involved because uh, the establishment of the state of Israel was understood in the Arab camp as an imperialist act. The German side is guilty of complicity and support of colonialist structures. From the point of view of its Arab counterparts, the Federal Republic is thus counteracting the traditional German-Arab friendship, which, depending on the source, is sometimes based on the fact that Germany was not a colonial power in North Africa and Arabia, 
sometimes on the veneration of Hitler, as in the example of Grand Mufti Husseini, or on Rommel's fight in North Africa, which was understood as anti-imperialist. This is not only yet another different level of memory, but this last example alone shows the complexity of German-Arab relations after 1945, which culminated 20 years later in the conflict in 1965. Since I do not want to go into detail on the political history of this conflict, I want to highlight a central point of the conflict that is essentially of memory political nature. There are three individual aspects to be considered in the escalation towards the breakdown of relations. For the Federal Republic, the implementation of Hallstein Doctrine and its policy of non-recognition towards East Berlin is about the central historical focus of one united Germany. Ulbricht's invitation to Cairo is thus also a questioning of the historical reference point of the Federal, Federal Republic. The Arab side explicitly takes up this point and draws a parallel to the situation in the Middle East. What the Germans see as the division of a nation that is actually united, or at least should be, the Arab side sees as the same as Israel as a foreign body in an Arab unity. Obviously, it is only perceived Arab unity. Thirdly, there is a dispute over German rocket scientists in Egypt, According to Israel, German scientists and ex-military personnel from the NS times, who are difficult to control on the German side, are building weapons-capable missile systems and in Egypt and are used in the diplomatic dispute as an argument of renewed threat of destruction by German weapons. This triad not only connects various levels of memory and historical images already mentioned, it also updates them and shows how individual aspects inter interpreted changed and also instrumentalized, instrumentalized them. To show you the, uh, how this uh, looks in historical sources, I brought you um, uh, um, uh, Ambassador Federer, um, who is, was talking to re representatives of Egypt, Egypt, Egyptian uh, um, Ministry of Foreign Policy, representatives of Egyptian Ministry of Foreign Policies. Uh, both in this conversation, both sides um, define their views of uh, um, foreign policy, especially with the focus on Middle Eastern policy. The German view is uh, the Israeli right to exist and survive as a fundamental binding consequence for uh, for the federal uh, German foreign policy deriving from the experiences and memories of the horrors of the Second World War. A bit later, he said, for our own perspective, German unity is a most essential part of our foreign policy concept. It is a history of sorrow and delight that runs deep in our national identity. His counterpart, or one of his counterparts, the uh, advisor Sabri, uh, that later uh, becomes um, the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Egypt, um, does quite the same. He uh, said implementing Israel as a state from the outside, not only as a late example of imperialism, but it cut apart out of the thousand-year-old heart of Arab unity. This shows quite well that um, uh, memory uh, is uh, used as an argument, but only uh, as a, a blueprint for uh, national identity and uh, a moral uh, background for um, decision making in, pol in the political process. Instrumentalization in particular raises the question of actors and their agendas. Who refers to the past in general and to aspects of remembrance policy in particular, and how and why? In this regard, it must be said that the field of actors in the diplomatic communication space differs only slightly between the two parties, despite great differences in the political systems. For the diplomatic sources, three main fields of origin can be identified. First and foremost, and certainly with the lion's share in the sources, are ambassadors and bureaucrats of the ministerial structure. Secondly, politicians outside the ministerial structures emerge as separate actors, sometimes acting together, sometimes independent, independently of institutionalized foreign policy. Last, but definitely, definitely not least, media in general, but especially press products such as daily newspapers emerge in the sources. Although they do not have direct influence on foreign policy structures, 
their statements are perceived and woven into the otherwise elite discussion. An exception to this is on the Egyptian side, Mohammed Haikal, who as a publisher and at the same time closest advisor and friend of President Nasser, not only publishes for, on foreign, foreign policy, but also appeared himself and quite frequently at that as a negotiator and interlocutor for the federal public. A significant uh, difference or a clear assignment of one of these groups of actors to a certain way of using or referring to memory and the past cannot be determined. Rather, one must distinguish the extent to which a concrete reference to the past or constructions of memory on the part of the speaker represent an instrument of realpolitik or a moral legitimation strategy of his or her actions. Memory always seemed to be both and is adapted both in content and tone depending on the interlocutor and situation. It can be observed that the, these adjustments are also made with regard to the visibility of the interaction in the domestic or foreign press. An exclusive focus on traditional Arab friendship is hardly to be found in diplomatic communication accessible to the public, but references to a correspondingly changed attitude as a lesson from World War II that must now be displayed that is accessible. This is where realpolitik and moral legitimacy are mixed. The moral and um, above all historical debate about the Middle East, Israel and the Arab states becomes an argument of politi political realism. But memory is uh, relevant for another question regarding actorship, and that's how to become or even not to become an actor of political decision making. I brought to you uh, two examples. The first is a very good but complex uh, example. It is Harald Focke. Harald Focke is a former diplomat, uh, former Western German diplomat. Uh, he becomes a journalist in the 60s. And uh, he is on par uh, regarding knowledge and um, insight with the professionals in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or other professionals in the foreign policy sphere. But he is shunned by the decision makers and uh, cannot influence decision making processes due to his uh, perspective on history and uh, um, memory, especially uh, regarding lessons from the the Second World War. He obtains a very hard stance um, uh, that is pro-Israelic and uh, um, especially anti-Arab uh, national against and, uh, Arab nationalism. The second is a very striking um, example of uh, the uh, above-mentioned Grand Mufti Mohammed Amin Al Husseini that. Um, had very close ties to the NS regime. You can see him with Adolf Hitler in Berlin on the right side. Um, he even tried to gather support for uh, foreign SS uh, regiments in the Middle East in the 1940s. And he tried to use his connection to German official, officials from the 1940s to gather support for uh, Palestinian refugees in the 1960s. Um, the, uh, this is uh, what I brought here is the answer to the question, if the German Chancellor should answer a letter by uh, El Husseini and uh, uh, Ministerial Office, Officer Gelhoff um, issues Mufti Mohammed Amin Al Husseini is an especially relentless enemy of the Israeli state. Due to his close ties to the NS regime, it is absolutely not advised that the Chancellor of the FDR issues an answer. And here you can see that um, their stance on history and a certain kind of memory uh, can kick you out of decision-making processes quite uh, directly. The juxtaposition of different references to memory and the past continues in, in the further course of time. Until the resumption of relations with the Arab states in the first half of the 1970s, however, individual strands of memory are perpetuated in different ways. While smaller issues of contention, such as the dispute over German rocket scientists, can be resolved in the short term or get lost in the day-to-day -day political business, the political memory complexes of the Second World War, colonialism, and the territorial division continue to determine German-Arab relations. The Arab idea of recognizing Rommel Germans 
in the representatives of the Federal Republic who can be included in an anti-colonialist and above all pro-Arab camp has been constantly negated by the Federal Republic. Although there are political projects to honor and bury the German dead in the Second World War in North Africa, the West German side has been able to largely avoid the exploitation by Arabs for an anti-Western, anti-Israeli position. The central event for the transformation of most of the hard fronts in the interpretation of the Holocaust and the resulting conclusions for a West German foreign policy is certainly the June War of 1967, which is meticulously documented and discussed by the Foreign Office of the Federal Republic, sometimes even in hourly increments. In addition to a broad public debate about guilt, the reasons for the war and the role of the confrontation between East and West, this war provides the occasion and the opportunity for a readjustment in the Middle East policy of the Federal Republic, as a result of which the principle of non-interference, equal treatment, rejection of territorial gains through war and reference to supranational decisions, in this case the UN, are formed. While this readjustment follows realpolitik considerations, it also resorts to a strategy of legitimizing through memory politics. Where previously support for Israel was justified by the lessons of the Second World War and the Holocaust, the lessons are now abstracted and detached from the thick point of Israel without questioning its right to exist. Reconciliation and reparations are replaced by a commitment to a peaceful solution that takes all sides into account. It is therefore not without reason that this process is considered one of the foundations of the civil power concept in German political science. Of course, this readjustment. Oh, um, sorry to interrupt. I'm just to say that you have two minutes left. Oh, okay. Um, then uh, okay, just uh, just go with it. Um, of course, the readjustment does not only take place on the basis of current considerations of memory, but is embedded in process of detent and turning away from the Hallstein doctrine. While German foreign policy is benefiting from this event of 1967. 67, by expanding its room for maneuver, the situation is rather the opposite for the other parties of the conflict. They turn to, uh, to supranational um, um, organizations like the UN to better represent their own interests at the international level and obtain a more um, de-radicalized uh, communication on the diplomatic level regarding the Middle Eastern conflict. There obviously is a newly found middle ground between both parties and therefore we can see um, with this development um, we can speak of a memory alliance since both sides actively agree upon a common ground regarding remembrance which is then the basis of common policy between both sides at the same time it's the basis for the successive resumption of relations with the arab states uh, for both sides, the newly found um, position of Western German foreign, of foreign policy in the Middle East is called as a normalization process. And therefore, um, it is uh, considered a, um, a, newly, a newly found middle ground to resume um, relations uh, between both parties. The occupation with memory and the past in diplomatic communications between the Federal Republic of Germany and the Arab states show that these points are central to le legitimization strategies both, both externally and internally. It becomes clear that ignoring them would leave large gaps in the question of mo motives and patterns of action. At the same time, it becomes clear how changeable and socially negotiated the respective topoi are. Memory, memory, like other socially constructed knowledge and interpretations, is subject to the desires, events, currents of thought and political constraints. Thank you for your kind attention and your questions later on. Thank you very much, Christoph. Now let me um, hand over to um, Felix Kravatsek, who is a senior researcher um, at the at ZOIS, at the Center for, for East European International Studies, um, and a much better timekeeper than I am. All right. Thank you very much, Dave. Thank you very much to all five of you for um, wonderful presentations. And it was a great pleasure to read your papers, and I'll try to provide my, my two cents on them, hopefully bringing the discussion. Um, into movement. Um, Marek, on your paper, I think a really important contribution. And I would 
even encourage you to be a bit more radical about the importance of these convictions that you that you lie out and to what extent they mattered in misconceptions of politics because the convictions that you that you describe the four paradigms of the end of the Cold War, how it was memorialized, I think really have profound political implications, for instance, in terms of how Europe constructed its security policy and many and many other fields. Um, and kind of whilst on the one hand, I think being more radical about the implications of the convictions that you outline, um, it also for us as scholars is a really important message there that we need to be much more sensitive to the narratives that emerge about events and question who has the power to establish these narratives, because all of the convictions that you are outlining, I mean, they are linked to agents, um, they are linked to a particular perspective on the end of the Cold War, the one that came to prevail, and maybe we as scholars in the years after also fail to some extent to invert our perspectives into questions where these narratives come from, be it, for instance, ignoring the Yugoslav wars that you've mentioned yourself, um, but also to give one other example, I mean, Portuguese and Spanish perspectives on the end of the Cold War that don't overlap at all with how Germany or East European countries perceive of 89 or 91. And that, again, has important implications for um, European politics. And I'm saying that because I think these conventions really turned out to be quite detrimental um, for Europe, in particular for the place they gave to Germany, um, by making Germany kind of a paradigmatic case for a glorious end of difficult political developments. Um, and, and in that way, they made it impossible or kind of discouraged actors from actually seeing the new kinds of inequalities that the end of the Cold War produced or the systematic asymmetries that um, that are part of internet have been part of international politics um, post 89-91. So I think the lessons from this misperception um, are really important. But my fear is that these very reductionist perceptions of the Cold War, they continue to travel extremely well. And I remember when Zelensky was addressing the Bundestag in April, I mean, there was the one obvious historical reference, well, never again, and by not delivering weapons, you're repeating the never again. But the other one that had an extremely important echo in um, the German domestic audience was that he was echoing the 1987 um, Reagan speech by asking Olaf Scholz to tear down that wall that Germany is helping to erect by not assisting Ukraine. So in a way, also actors from the regions are themselves, of course, reproducing a very reductionist narrative of um, the end of the Cold War. And I think that the Zelensky reference, um, and he's very apt kind of at adjusting historical references to different national audiences, but in the German case, um, I think it's a very strong illustration for how the Cold War can still serve, based on the four kind of wrong convictions that you outlined, as a call, as a call to action, um, and therefore also as a, a real urge for us as scholars um, to be much more sensitive to the origins of the perspectives of the narratives that we are reproducing in our scholarship. And in a way, that's a kind of nice transition to Monica's paper, which also encourages us to think more about who has the narrative authority to establish a framework of continent-to-continent -continent relations um, when we speak about Europe, European-African um, relations. And I think the point that you're making is very well received, that there's more complexity needed to the debates on on colonialism and the fact that colonialism isn't only related to Western modernity, but also a byproduct or maybe even central to 8th to 12th century kind of Arab modernity as well, or that there is an inner African colonialism that tends to all be downplayed with this focus on um, on the European African relationships taking as a as a kind of a, a box in in each of these cases. Um, and what is always interesting for me is, I mean, the research on inner Arab colonialism, um, the research is done, it's just not part of the public debate, right? I mean, scholars have worked on these topics for long, um, but the public discourse has taken a different perspective. And I think the larger theoretical message that is in your paper, um, that heterogeneity of European memory, I think is really, is really important, even beyond that Europe-African con complex that you are, that you are working on. Um, because Europe itself has been pretty bad at acknowledging that heterogeneity, be it from Brussels institutions, but also kind of the Franco-German memory core, which has projected this idea of homogeneity and European integration. Um, and I think when it comes to colonialism, it's particularly detrimental because it projects a kind of responsibility on parts of Europe that were never themselves 
the driving forces in colonialism, but now, by virtue of being part of Europe, share a responsibility. And of course, that can lead to profound political backlashes, can actually be a very potent argument for um, the political actors on the ALS. Um, but even there, I would say one could go one step further, um, because that also applies to the nation state. I mean, that's not only a problem that Europe has, but has anyone asked um, Britons or Scots whether they really want to be part of that national community and the responsibility that comes with it? And therefore, I think the continent-to-continent -continent framework needs to be taken apart a bit more, also to look at who were the drivers within each of the nation states of colonialism, because it were not peasants from rural southern France or uh, Welsh farmers who were driving British or French colonialism. Um, and so I would encourage you to kind of break that, make that even more complex um, to get better grips with the uh, political and historical reality. Of course, as you are aware as well, I mean, there's a very powerful um, and not completely unjustified post-colonial discourse projected on the European countries. Um, and I would like to hear you speak a little bit more about what then it means to have been involved in colonialism. I mean, you bring up the, the Swiss case. Switzerland never had colonies. Fair enough. But Switzerland hugely benefited, of course, from everyone else being a criminal, right? Kind of building a bank on the misery of the world. That seems to be the <laughs> Swiss leitmotif of um, national wealth. <laughs> and that maybe is part of national guilt, right? I mean, is it kind of washing your hands clean if you're just depositing the funds from, be it Russian oligarchs or colonial or colonialists, um, that is certainly a part of complicity that we need to deal with, even if we haven't conquered, we being me as Switzerland, which I'm not, but um, <laughs> if we haven't co conquered parts of the territory. Um, and so that's, that's something I would like to hear you speak a little bit more. And related to that, I guess, what then are, what is your demand? I mean, what would you expect to be articulated on the European level as a more reasonable engagement with the colonial atrocities. That, What I understand is you don't want, obviously, to kind of diminish that, but you ask for a different engagement with it. I mean, what would be your postulate? How, how should the negative consequences of colonialism be dealt with in a more appropriate way? Then, turning to... Paula's paper, I think I now have to look into this camera, I try to. Um, thank you very much, that was also a very, a very interesting presentation. Um, I would like to have, have one kind of more general academic question um, related <coughs> to the topic of memory loss, Paula, and that is, I mean, we now see plenty of memory loss that are in blatant conflict with the norms of liberal democracies. We see memory loss flourishing primarily in autocracies of all shape, um, but should we conclude from there that from an academic perspective, maybe memory loss are as such undesirable um, because they're a limitation of free speech and free speech really is the core of every democracy. Um, now, a little bit detached from the examples that you gave in the presentation and thinking further, I mean, what is your general take on, on that question of the, the extent to which or, the, or under what conditions memory loss are desirable? And I would just like to remind the audience, I mean, the German and French examples that Paula gave, these were all memory laws pushed for by the left, by the kind of central left in France or Germany, in order to protect the status of victims to prevent the harm in free speech. Um, so, yeah, the question there is, under what conditions would you say um, <coughs> are these type of restrictions of free speech um, desirable? Then... On the kind of more now on, on the paper and the, the points you made, remembering the new atrocities, um, you're claiming that there will be a diversification of laws. Now I'd like to kind of push back on that a little bit um, because we've seen so many atrocities since um, 1989, um, be it the war in Yugoslavia, be it Syria, and all of these have been largely forgotten. I mean, many of the viol much of the violence that we've seen post-45 has not led to a profound shift in the way memory is legalized and how states understand themselves. And maybe that is because the genocide of um, part that was part of World War II, or maybe the defining feature of World War II, is the overarching moral kind of driving force for how Western societies understand themselves. So do you really think, as dramatic as the war in Ukraine is, that this will be able to unsettle the normative consensus or the kind of mnemonic orientation that we have? Um, because what I can see happening, rather, 
is that we are going to have this chain of equivalent events. And that's where what we've already seen over kind of the last few years emerge, that there's the Shoah as the overarching genocide, and then comes, oh, and we also remember, bang, 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 a list of 10 other atrocities um, that all set on an equal footing, all part of one sentence, um, but they don't really matter. It's just a long list of events that politicians feel obliged to mention. Um, and I, I'm a bit concerned that the same could happen um, with the new atrocities that, um, that you're talking about. I think another question that emerges there is, even if we see new legal provisions emerge, um, given the profound political fragmentations, I mean, are we going to hold anyone accountable for violating the norms that are being set in specific contexts? I mean, Putin to Den Haag is a prominent statement, but it is also one that, given where the world stands at the moment, <laughs> seems extremely unlikely. Um, or even Russian soldiers who are committing crimes against humanity in Ukraine. I mean, who will hold these actors accountable, even if the legal context um, changes? Another point I would like to make um, related to the kind of increasing legalization of historical or memory discourse is to think about the, um, the international effects um, linking to the question of to what extent they are, they are desired. Because the more Western actors introduce bans on free speech or deny or kind of limit the way we can frame political and social events, of course, that has effects not only within the nation state, but also beyond. And I'm always finding it quite irritating to see how Russian lawmakers reference French and German memory laws in order to justify Russian limitations on free speech. Of course, that completely ignores the respective political contexts, but nevertheless, if kind of the West holds that free speech is a fundamental element of, um, of democracies, then limiting free speech sets an important international precedent for countries that want to limit what, what its citizens can say. And um, so the international effects of restrictions on historical discourse, I think, are really important. And then last point on the privatization of memory. Of memory um, I'm not so sure if we are really going to see a privatization. I think at the moment it's more of a struggle between the states very forcefully intervening on these private platforms in order to restrict what can be said um, on them. And obviously most flagrant that is in countries such as China and Russia, where there's a very strict policing um, of the statements that you can make on social media. And therefore, I'm not sure if the historical discourse that we see emerge on social media is necessarily a privatization, could just be a kind of adjustment of the state, reinventing the role that the state thinks it should have. Um, and especially China, I think, is a very strong example of forcing private actors to adopt the norms also of historical discourse, but in general social norms um, that the state sees appropriate. So maybe it's not so much privatization, but kind of a state extending its rules to private actors that then have to implement them because otherwise they will be banned from the country, as um, we've seen in the Chinese case. How would you? Um, Thank you very much. So here's your 131st article, I guess, um, that you're <laughs> <laughs> about to produce. So um, maybe I've got some ideas that help make the article even, even better. The first thing I would like to underline is that you expose to us a very long list of all seemingly very important factors that explain why the Holocaust is remembered, but the Armenian genocide not so much. And I was, and I remain a bit confused as to what type of factors are effects and what type of factors are causes. And I think it's really important to distinguish between these two. And at the moment you give this list of six or seven elements that all matter, but the reader or listener doesn't understand what is driving what and what is finally only an artifact of having been driven by the other factors. And it seems to me that many of the reasons that you, that you mentioned, they are actually effects, like the number of museums, the availability of teaching material, the number of Holocaust study university chairs, the question of recognition. These are, in my understanding, not causes of why the Armenian genocide is less remembered than the Holocaust, um, but these are effects of underlying causes. And I think it would be really important for the paper to take these elements apart a little bit more. And that would help the paper to be streamlined, bring some hierarchy into these causes and effects. Um, because at the moment, it seems like everything matters. And I'm guessing, to some extent, that's the case. But still, we would 
need some some analytic clarity here. Um, and then I would also encourage the paper to kind of make a theoretical contribution. I mean, the larger theoretical puzzle that is in this paper relates to the question of when is an event forgotten? Under what conditions does an event just disappear from global consciousness? Um, and maybe it simply is that the Holocaust became the kind of mnemonic reference point for the post-45 world order, but you want to draw a more complex picture. And I think that that would be a great contribution to make. When is an event forgotten? When does it resurface? What's the, I mean, you know, hierarchy of reasons again, What's the role of the mnemonic Black Knight in the Armenian case, Turkey, right? I mean, is that the driving factor that helps us understand the forgetting of, of an event, um, or in general, the relationship between international politics and domestic? I think that's where this research can make, can make a very nice theoretical contribution. And maybe then it's worth not to contrast it so much with the Holocaust, because that is, a, in many ways, asymmetrical comparison that isn't always so happy but to compare it to other forgotten historical events that had the potential to be remembered on a global scale because of their, um, of their significance. Maybe that would be a more interesting um, comparative research design. And then last but not least, um, Christoph, thank you very much um, for, for the paper. Um, that was also a very interesting read and uh, thanks for, for the presentation as well. I think my First overarching remark relates to the question of, um, kind of again, the theoretical framing of the case study. I mean, is this, what is this case study really about? As a historian, I know historians are interested for cases as cases, um, but here you're also seeking to speak to social scientists, I think, and there's the potential for doing so in, in the language that you're using. And the question that you need to answer is this, to what extent is it generalizable? To what extent do the insights travel? What are the theoretical gains? Um, and I think there a lot more work can be done. Second point I would like to make is the, the assumption here is that this is about memory, but in the kind of quotes that you gave and the material that you showed, I wasn't always convinced that this is actually about memory or whether history merely provides a discursive context for these actors to relate to one another. And therefore, maybe a term such as legacy is more fitting here rather than the perspective of, um, of memory politics. And some of the examples, it seems like history is primarily a rhetorical device. It's part of how actors have to present themselves, but it's not about a debate on the interpretation of history. Um, and I think that's where there can be a great theoretical contribution um, in the case study that you're, that you're undertaking. And that is to adjudicate a little bit about Yes, memory is visible everywhere in all kinds of political actions. And when we research these topics, of course, we always find historical references. But the question is, to what extent does that matter? I mean, when do these historical references make a difference? And when are they only accompanying factors? Um, and I think that would be, with this historical perspective that you can take, much better source availability than in the present to some extent. I would like to, to hear more about that. What really is the impact that memory has on foreign relations. Um, and then one last point, and then I'll, I'll shut up, Jade, um, is the question of um, where is the broader public as an actor? This morning we had the, the lecture on new public diplomacy or public diplomacy, um, and we learned that the public really has a role to play also in foreign policies and also the, the historical views on the public. Um, and I wonder a bit, where are the two societies of the regions of the countries um, that you're looking at? And link to that the question of who is actually the audience for the historical references that you're finding in the archives. I mean, is this high politics between diplomats and so on, um, exchanging notes between one another and talking about history? Or is there an audience? And who is that audience? What is the effect that these historical references are to have um, for the audience that that they are addressing and that policymakers would like to convince. Um, I think it will be important to, again, elevate the case study to resonate with the wider literature. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much to, well, sorry, you get a clap too. <laughs> sorry.
Thank you very much to all of our speakers and to, to Felix for very detailed comments. I think given that we are three minutes away from lunch and that this has been um, a long panel with five speakers, it makes sense that anybody who's here could ask their questions perhaps over lunch um, to our speakers. And um, I will also pass on the um, Zoom questions to, to each of the, to the relevant speakers as well um, because yeah, I think that makes more sense. And also, I don't want to in I don't want to in any way impact on anybody's lunch. I don't want to in any way be held responsible for the next panel starting starting late. So this is the easiest way for me to get off scot free. But um, thank you, thank you very much, Felix. Thank you very much to all of our wonderful speakers and for such um, such excellent presentations. Thank you.